Time Hunter, The Severed Man, by George Mann, read by Terry Malloy. Screams. Like wretched, tortured, agonized yowls, they echo into the cold emptiness of the room. A base animal whimpering, a gurgle of pain. A needle and a hot, flickering flame. Light replacing darkness, replacing light. As if someone is staring at car headlamps, hurtling along a road. As if they're watching the flickering on a broken television set that's been tuned to a dead channel. And blood. Lots of blood. A voice is there, too. Somewhere beneath the agony, rasping a name. It is laughing at the history that is dissipating all around it, swirling away into nothingness as the darkness moves in to swallow everything. In this room here, there is only the present. A long and torturous second, stretched out and maintained aloof from time as if the rest of the universe has suddenly ceased to exist. No one can remember how they arrived, or how long they have actually been here. Only the pain and the darkness remain. A figure rises from somewhere in this darkness, but the view of it is hazy, dreamlike, as if seen from behind a veil. It stares with shining, glassy eyes at the looping time streams all around it, watching as they bubble away into the future and the past, watching as they alter ever so slightly, as the screaming comes to an abrupt halt and the ebb and flow of another existence dissolve against the persistent flow of time, dashed into fragments of nothing as if they had never actually existed. Another one cut free. Another one released from time's ticking bonds. The figure steps away, carefully laying its implements down on a surface nearby. It wipes its hands on a dirty smock and then steps towards another figure, this one prone on a bench a few feet away. Presently, the screaming starts all over again. For the tiniest of moments, the first figure hesitates as if unsure whether or not to carry on, as if the horror of its actions has finally begun to register behind its eyes. But then it picks up its tools once again, and the blood begins to flow down its arms, pooling on the floor in large puddles of glossy red. This time the pain is different. This time it is far more acute. The figure continues to labour over its charge, sweat running down its heavily creased brow. After all, there are many others waiting to be released from their shackles, and tonight it has much, much work to do. The marketplace was deserted, ethereally quiet. Honoré Lechasseur felt the tiny hairs on the back of his neck bristle against the cold and shivered. Spitalfields was usually thronging with people, even at this late hour. Empty, it just felt wrong, somehow unnatural. He shifted his feet and blew into his cupped hands in an attempt to keep warm. The fog was thick and penetrating around him, stifling the radial glow of the street lamps. On the opposite side of the road, the scorched remains of the old church stood sentry-like against the moonlight, casting shadows across the street in wide, sweeping arcs. Around it, the remnants of splintered gravestones erupted from the soft loam, describing a shattered smile of jagged, broken teeth. The shadows would be a good place to hide. Lechasseur glanced about trying to catch sight of his prey. He'd been tracking the boy across the capital for nearly three hours, only stopping to catch his breath in the stolen moments before rounding a bend or waiting to step out of a doorway. Now he was cursing himself for losing sight of the child. He stepped out into the road, listening for any sign of movement. Nothing. 
the marketplace was absolutely deserted. He glanced in both directions, up and down the road. The fog was everywhere, dampening the air. He'd have to start again in the morning. He sighed and turned about, ready to start the long trek back towards his lodgings. Damn boy. Then, in the quietness, he heard the scuff of a heel from somewhere behind him. He span around, catching sight of the child ducking around a corner just a few feet away, his ragged scarf fluttering behind him as he ran. Leshesur took off after him.